I was talking with someone earlier. Uh, they they said, you know, it's, it's, it looks like it's going to rain outside. And I said, yeah, I feel like I've been bamboozled because my weather app told me that it wasn't supposed to rain until 7 p.m. They lied to me. That's all right. I don't mind getting wet. All right. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about the power of unity. There's strength in unity. There's strength when we do this, uh, when we walk in unity. So would you please stand with me as we read from the word of the Lord? Our passage this morning is the whole chapter of Psalm 133. All three verses. It says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, for the ability as believers to walk in unity, and I pray for a unity of faith in this place. As we minister the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we work together towards a common goal of seeing, seeking and saving the lost, um, Lord, I thank you that not only is there unity of faith, but it, it doesn't make us all robots, but rather working together for the common goal. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. I think it's fascinating. In that passage there this morning, talks about like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron. If you've ever studied out the word and read in the Old Testament, you find that when Aaron was anointed, they anointed him with a lot of oil. I mean, it's a lot of oil. If, you've, if we dig into it, I think it's like 86 pounds of spices plus the five or six gallons of oil that runs over his, that they mix together, and it has a wonderful fragrance to it as well. It said that you could smell it where they, the temple was. You could smell it all over the area of Jerusalem or wherever it was that they were anointing the priest. Uh, for example, Aaron, when they were out in the wilderness, it could be smelled all throughout the camp. It was an amazing smell. I actually got to see this done um, to some one of our students when I was in Bible school. They had a student picked, and they had him stand on a pedestal, and they poured, I think it was like five gallons of oil over his head. It was amazing. The interesting thing about this is when they're anointing, when you're being anointed, you cannot keep your head straight up. You have to put your head down because if you keep it straight up, the oil wants to run in your nostrils and you can't breathe. And how many know breathing is kind of important when you're living, right? So they have to bow their heads and into a reverent position. But then that oil runs down all over their face and in his beard. I can imagine what Aaron's beard looked like, you know, coming down off of his beard and whatnot. But it was a precious thing. It smelled good, it was a precious thing, and it was a sign of a priestly, of, of, of blessing for that person. And when we walk in unity, it is like that. There's an oil that's released. There is a, an anointing oil that takes place. You see, God is pleased with unity. God is three parts. He is unified completely so that there is no division among him, even though there's three parts, he's all one. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? So he is all about unity. He's about unity and a faith. When the disciples were in the upper room, they were all in one Honda, right? Accord. They're all in one accord. That means they were unified. They were all together. They were unified and praying towards the common goal. And when there's unity, there is power. And where there's power, there's demonstration. When there's demonstration, there's manifestation. When there's manifestation, you can see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But it all goes back to having that unity. We have to be unified as believers in Christ, because if we're not unified, we're working against the common goal, are we not? And we know that our common goal is, to, goal is to seek and save that which is lost, because that's what Jesus came to do, and he made disciples to continue on his work. And he also said, these works that I do, greater works than these will you do. Wow, he said, what? And that wasn't just to the disciples back when Jesus was alive. I mean, Jesus was here, because he still is alive. We, unfortunately, we, we, sometimes we get this mindset that, oh, well, that was just for the disciples that were with Jesus. No, Jesus told the disciples to go do what? Make more disciples who are to make more disciples. Why? Because we have an expiration date. I have an expiration date. You have an expiration date. 
we all will expire one day. That's unfortunate. That's part of life. Death is until Christ redeems this body. But, and he knew that. So therefore, he had to pass that down through each generation so that continues to move from generation to generation. Not only is the call there to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also the power is there so that the manifestation and demonstration can take place. I'm getting Holy Ghost goosebumps just talking about this. Why? Because we need it. Jesus said, it is expedient that I go back to the Father so that I can send the comforter to you. Why? Because we need to be endued with power from on high. He told the disciples, go into Jerusalem and wait in the upper room. What's interesting, as I just realized this the other day, I've been studying my Bible for years, that he was with them for 40 days after his resurrection. And on the 50th day is when they were endued with power from on high. So there was only 10 days there where they're waiting with, with Jesus wasn't with them because he was already in heaven. The Holy Spirit wasn't with them. He, there was 10 days where they were just waiting. But yet they were faithful to wait those 10 days, even though it was 50 days from the, his resurrection. They were willing to wait that 10 days. And when they waited, and because they were faithful to do so, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them in the upper room. And it didn't stop there, but that was just the beginning. And they were unified in faith. And we see throughout the scriptures, when people are unified, great things can happen. So let's get into this. There was a college professor, and he gave his class a chance to evaluate the course. And one of his students wrote this. He said, I think this is an excellent class, but I'm concerned that the professor puts too much responsibility for learning on the students. Okay, you can think about that one for a minute. So I hope that you came today expecting to learn and to apply what you learn. You see, it's one thing to sit here. It's another thing to take what we learn and put it in action. You see, faith without works is what? Dead. So if, with, if faith without works is dead, then we can learn all the stuff in the world and say, yeah, I've got faith. But if we don't put feet to our faith, then it is useless to us. I hope we realize that it's a responsibility of the individual to grow in the Lord. Does that make sense? It's my responsibility that I grow in the Lord. It's not yours. It's not anybody above me. or It's, not, it's nowhere else. It's not my parents' responsibility that I grow in the Lord. It's my responsibility because I'm the one who have to stand before the Lord and give an account for Jason Bernard. You won't give an account for me. I have to stand before the Lord and give an account of what I did with my life. So I hope that we realize it's our responsibility to grow. Now, there was a second grade Sunday school class that had been emphasizing the memorization of Scripture. And I would encourage you to, as well to, to memorize Scripture. And one little seven-year-old was beginning to get into the program. He was getting his stuff down. He's, it seemed like he was working on his memory work at home. His dad was inquiring into the whole procedure and asked him, he said, what prize or what reward do you get if you learn all these verses? And, and the son just eyed him with that simple childlike look and said, we get to learn more. May that be our attitude towards the Word of God. When I memorize this, and I get to learn more. When, when I get this down, I get to learn more. There's always more to learn. You see, the Bible is more than just a, a, a written document. It's more than just black and white or red letters. It is it, There's more than one dimension to it. There's three dimensions to this thing. There's, I would even say more than that. Because you can just read over a passage, and how many have read over a passage? It may be for years, and then all of a sudden one day, as you're reading that passage, that thing jumps out at you. I had never seen that before. That's the th three-dimensional part of it. You, you get more to it. There's more depth to it, especially when we have the Holy Spirit, when we allow Him to guide us and teach us. The Holy Spirit was sent not only to comfort us, and not only to empower us, but also to teach us things to come as well. And he's there to teach us and guide us and direct us. We just got to listen to him. Have you ever experienced something that was good for you but not pleasant? Well, for example, dental work. It may be good for you, but it wasn't pleasant. I can't think of any worse noise aside from fingers down a chalkboard than a dentist drill. Or, or how about, um, let me see, what else? Exercise or even an operation. You know, it might not be pleasant, but it's good for you. Now, how many have ever experienced something that's pleasant, but it's not good for you? Chocolate chip cookies, amen? <laughs> Twinkies, chocolate cake. 
I'm sure I could go through a whole list of everything that, that's not good for you, but it's pleasant. But today we're going to talk about unity. You see, unity is not only good for us, but it's also pleasant when we're unified. And we're going to be working on an acrostic this morning, the word team, T-E-A-M. Psalm, our first letter is together in the word team, together. So what I like about doing stuff like this is that you know that there are four points to this sermon. And once I get down to number three, you know we're in the home stretch because four is around the corner, right? All right, so here we go. Team, together is the T. Psalm 133.1, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, if you look at this, we find out who this is directed toward. It's directed towards the brethren. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we are brethren. All right, so we're all, this, is, this includes us all. You know, when we do not work together, did you know if we don't work together, the enemy wins? If we're not working together, enemy wins. In Knoxville, Tennessee, back in the early 70s, on the news there was a high school football team that had gone, against, gone in strike against their coach. I know this wouldn't happen at church, but this is what a football team did. They went on strike against their coach. And many of the players thought the coach was mean and the exercise was far too hard and demanding. Some of the players got their parents to agree with how mean and abusive this coach was in his, with his authority. They thought that the coach's requirements were excessive, and besides, the summer was also hot. The boys on the team undermined the authority of the coach and rebelled against his exercise program. And this may come as no surprise, but during that season, they lost every single game. They were not in shape, and their strike against the coach kept, them, kept the team from pulling together. That's what happens when you don't have unity. And then you have the other teams. Those of you who remember Vince Lombardi, he was a great coach. He took, was it, who was it, the Packers? Green Bay Packers. He took them to many national championships. And why? Because he would start with the simple things and get the team unified at the base and work his way forward. He was fired with enthusiasm. Oh, boy. Nothing shall contribute to a peaceful mind as much as a purpose and a sense of direction. We need constant purpose, and we need unity to make sure that that purpose is carried out. You see, when we work together in unity, much can be accomplished. And I know you've read your Bibles, and you're familiar with this next passage. It comes from Nehemiah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. It says this, But it so happened, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, <coughs> excuse me, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heap of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him and said, Whatever they build, if even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O God, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. This is Nehemiah praying here again. And do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Do you catch that? For the people had a mind to work. And when you study this out, if you've ever read Nehemiah, you'll find it. They would carry, they had a sword in one hand or on their side and the tools in the other. Why? Because the enemy was real. The enemy was threatening them. And it's just like us. We have been given the sword of the Spirit. And the enemy is real and the enemy continues to threaten us. The difference is our enemy never sleeps. He doesn't take a break. That means we've got to be on our guard. And well, Nehemiah, they, he says further in the passage, you'll find that he said, we didn't even take our clothes off except for to wash them. So that's how, I mean, they were on guard all the time, and they were working on this wall. Nehemiah's enemies did all their best to discourage the Jews from rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, but through unity of mind, work, and purpose, the walls were repaired, all of them. Nehemiah, when he first got there, he went by night around the city walls. He'd come to a certain point where he had to get off of his donkey just to pass through to check out the walls to see how bad it was, and it was bad. 
but he knew that he'd been called for a purpose in such a time as this to take care of those walls to get them rebuilt. And that's what he was going to do. The walls were repaired also in record time. <clears throat> Nehemiah 6, 15 and 16 says this, So the wall was finished on the 20th, 25th day of Elul in, a 50, in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. When we accomplish the will of God together, the world cannot help but note that it is accomplished through the Lord. How did they get this done? It was through the unity in the Lord. They prayed to the Lord. They believed in provision. And then they worked together as one to see this task come to hand. It had to, be t it had to take place. And when the walls are broken down around our own lives, it works better if we work in unity, not only with each other, but also with the Lord himself. You see, if we're butting heads against the Lord, we aren't going to get anything accomplished. But if we are work, walking and working in unity with him, then great things can happen in our own lives. Will it be a fun process? Probably not. But it will be a fulfilling one in that things can change for the glory of the Lord. Are you with me? That God can take care of things in our lives. If we reckon, especially if we recognize something, God, this needs to change. He will take us through that process if we will walk in unity with him to see that thing either repaired, replaced, or made new. That's good news. This leads us to our next letter, E. Each. You say, well, you want us to work as unity, does that mean we're all cut out as cookie cutters and, you know, we all are supposed to like the same things and do the same things and work the same? No. Even though we work together, we are still individuals. Even though we work together, we are still individuals. I like cottage cheese. Many of you out there do not like cottage cheese. You say, what's that got to do with the work of the kingdom? I'm just saying we're each individuals, okay? Um, some of you um, may, uh, let me see. I don't know, do, do something that I, whatever. Like birds, yeah, or bird watching or whatever. You could name all the different birds, and I, I wouldn't have a clue. I'd be like, that's a red bird, that's a brown bird, that's a blue bird. I do know what a hummingbird looks like. Those are cool little birds. God knew what he was doing when he made hum, hummingbirds. Those are neat. I think my mansion has hummingbirds around it in heaven. Each individual brings something unique to the table. You are unique. Some of you more so than others, but you are unique. And you, every one of us brings something unique to the table when it comes to the kingdom and kingdom purpose and kingdom process. Each and every one of us is unique. It's just like the mighty thumb, this right here. Everyone, well, most everybody has a thumb digit. And um, the thumb allows man a privilege many other God's creations do not have. It's normally the thickest digit of the hand, and it's, um, it's in line kind of like with the, the big toe. If you look straight down, you can see your big toes on the same side as well. Not that I use my toes to grab things, but my socks cover them. So we've got the thumb. Um, and it's, it only has two phalanges, and it's uh, given greater freedom than the rest. If you notice your thumb, most people can touch their, their pinky with their thumb. I've got an uncle that he can do like this. <laughs> His hands are so thick. It's awesome. He's just he's a worker. He's a horse. But most of us can touch each one of our fingers. It gives our, us something to grab hold of. When we go to pick things up, because we have those thumbs, it gives us pressure that we can put against something to grasp it in our hands, does it not? Most animals do not have this privilege. They've got to use, if you ever watch a squirrel, he picks the, the nuts up and chews on them like that, whatever. Um, cats have paws and very sharp claws, too. Let me go move on. We've got the thumb. Um, th without the opposable digit, the thumb, our work would be limited. The thumb can offer resistance so that it can be held against the other digits. And because of this ability, we can hold on, grasp, hold, and uh, hold firm of different things. This makes us different than most species in the fact that we can do this. Aside from the fact that we're cognitive, we, we have a conscience, and we can speak and communicate clearly and and make things happen, and we have a spirit too. But the thumb is another thing that makes us unique. 
You know, sometimes in a body, we don't need to all be thumbs as a body of Christ, or fingers for that matter. Unity can be a reality because we are different, and thus we can make gains towards our mark and a high calling. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27 tells us this, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not but one is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has set each members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if these are all one member, where would the, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think are less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers... All the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. You ever gotten something in your eye before? What happens to your whole body? Everything stops and everything goes and gets directed to attention to that eye. Whether it is I got to get to the bathroom so I can wash my eye out or get to a mirror so I can see what's stuck in it. You know, uh, whatever it is, we stop and we make sure we take care of the eye. The body of Christ should be the same way. When one member is hurting, as unity is within the body, we hurt with them. If one member is honored, if, you know, then the whole body rejoices together. If I think of an archer. If an archer wins an Olympic competition, you know, it's not just his arms and hands that go up on the stage. His whole body goes up on the stage, does it not? It's not just his arms and hands and then the eye that sighted in it. That would be kind of awkward, wouldn't it? You see these two arms flop up on the stage and one of them throws his eyeball up there. That's not how it happens. The whole body goes up together, and it's the same way with the body of Christ. When one member is honored, don't get jealous over that member, but rather rejoice with that member. When one member is hurting, don't stand back and say, well, they deserve that. Uh Uh-oh. That's when we get into trouble. Did you hear about so-and-so? They're going through a rough time. I think it's because they weren't doing this or they were doing that or whatever. If they're hurting, the last thing they need is another part of the body put pouring salt in their wound. Or as I've heard I used many times before, why don't you just give me a, a paper cut and pour lemon juice in it? That'll bless you. Well, John Berger, the principal, encountered a ninth grade boy walking out of room 209. I'm sure you know what 209 is, right? This boy had a sour look on his face, and the concerned principal asked the boy, don't worry, I'll tell you. The concerned principal said, and how are we today? The boy replied, awful. I don't understand all that stuff the math teacher wants us to learn, all those logarithms and postulates postulates and stuff. The principal said smoothly and comfortingly, well, I'm sure we can't find it all that bad, can we? The boy huffed back. Well, sure, we can say that because the you half of we doesn't have to learn that stuff all over again with the me half of we. All right, well, don't worry, I'll be here all day. We need unity within the church, within the body. When one hurts, the others hurt. When one rejoices, the others rejoice with them. This leads us to the letter A and team accomplishes, accomplishes. As believers, we're called to accomplish the task at hand, and that task, again, we've mentioned this before, that's to do the will of the Father. Your calling in this life is to do the will of the Father for your life. Are you with me? The will of the Father for your life is not the same as the will of the Father for my life. 
Because not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everybody's called to be a, a layman. Not everybody's called to be a, a worker. Not everybody's called to be this and that and the other. We each have different callings, but we want to make sure that we fulfill the will of the Father. Now, we do have a common will to fulfill of the Father, and that is to seek and save the lost. All right? So we have a common and we have an uncommon. And the uncommon is each and every one of us has our own tasks to do. We're to do the will of the Father in our lives. We're to do the will of the Father in the lives of our families. And we're to do the will of the Father in the life of our church. And it brings me to this six-year-old little, little boy, Mark. He, little six-year-old Mark was thumbing through a Japanese cookbook. And this was an R mark right here. But he asked about the squiggly symbols in the Japanese cookbook. And his father explained that they were Japanese words and that he couldn't read them. Well, Mark paused and said, well, sound them out. Isn't that just like a kid? If you can't read them, well, sound them out, Dad. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Did you know that God has prepared works for you to walk in? He has prepared things for you to do. And this is where we need to be real careful in this life not to get sucked into what the world has to offer, but rather be asking the Father daily, Lord, what is it you want me to do today? What is it that you want me to do for your kingdom? Because that is the stuff that's going to last forever and ever and ever. The world stuff is not going to last forever. The, the new car, the new house, the, the, the new job, all that stuff, and I'm not saying don't work. Okay, Don't get that from me. Now, the Bible says that he who does not provide for his family is worse than, worse than an infidel. So we want to make sure we're doing what God has called us to do and do the things that he wants us to do to walk in his will for our lives. You say, well, how do I find out God's will for my life? This is where time with the Lord is going to be important, your personal prayer time. If when you come to church, this is the only time that you pray is when you're here at this church on Sunday mornings, you're starving yourself spiritually, uh, and, and especially in the area of prayer. God is looking for those times together with us, times by ourselves in our prayer closet. If you don't have a prayer closet, you can get in your prayer vehicle and pray there. If you don't have one of those, you can go outside in the, in, in the woods somewhere and just pray to the Lord, seek his face and seek his presence. And it's not, it's not a daunting task. It's actually fun. I say, it's fun? Yes, there is a joy that comes with when you start praying in the Spirit and praying to the Lord and getting into His presence, especially when His presence shows up. Wow, that's awesome. You know, when you're praying in your prayer closet and the presence of the Lord shows up, what an awesome, and, and it's just, I'm trying to put this into words. Um, it, it's an honor, I should say, that the creator of the universe would take time to spend time with us. Second Timothy three sixteen and 17 tells us this. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's another Scripture there with every good work. God has works for each and every one of us individuals to do. There are works for each individual to do. There are works that each individual church is called to do. And there are works that the body of Christ as a whole is called to do. And when we work in unity, there is strength. Have you ever, anybody here ever seen the giant sequoia trees in California? I haven't seen them in person, but I've, I've seen pictures online. They are enormous. Some of them reach up to close to 300 feet in height. That is amazing to me. But I, want to know, I don't know if you know this or not. They have very shallow roots. I found this on www.giant-sequoia.com, frequently asked questions. You can find this there, too. The sequoias have a matting, shallow, and wide-spreading root system. There's no tap root. They only root to 12 to 14 deep, even at maturity. A mature sequoia's roots can occupy, listen to this, over one acre of earth that contain over 90,000 cubic feet of soil. That mass of matted roots and soil has to maintain the equilibrium of a tree that is nearly 300 feet tall and weighs nearly 2 million pounds. They grow together. Their roots grow together. That is how they are unified so that they can stand 
the test of time. They can stand the winds, and they can grow large. So when those roots come together and they work together as a unified front, they can actually accomplish more, grow bigger and greater. And this works in the same way in the body of Christ. When we are unified together, then we can accomplish the things God has called us to do, and we can come against the impossible that may be in our way. We're called to unity. Whenever believers bond together, we can withstand the attacks of the enemy. But when the enemy can sow discord, then he weakens the body. I believe this is for somebody here this morning. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. I'm reminded of the commercial for the, from the 1980s. I've fallen and I can't get up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? The one may be overpowered by another. Two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You ever tried to snap a threefold cord? <laughs> I, I remember as a teenager, I'd have to try and break some string. You know, one piece of string was no problem, and then I got to two, and I was like, ow, and it hurt to, and three, I was just like, give me the scissors. I try and chew through it with my teeth, but that didn't help either. All right, so let's move on to our last letter. M stands for more. This is the interesting thing about kingdom work. There's always more to be done. The next person that needs to hear about Jesus, the next missionary that needs our support, the next mission trip that needs attending. No matter your age, there's something for you to do in the kingdom. You are not too young, young people. Those of you in public school are missionaries to your peers. Listen, you have access to people that others do not have access to. You are God's not-so-secret secret agent. I like that. By the way, for the, considering those of you who are young, let's talk about you old people. You are not too old. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. You cannot retire until you expire. That goes for every single one of us, no matter how young you are. You cannot retire until you expire. By the way, the Great Commission is not about us being comfortable. The Great Commission is about us reaching the lost. One of the, our themes for AG in the past was to the ends of the earth. I remember that one, to the ends of the earth. I think we probably got one of those posters around here somewhere. You know, that has not been done yet. So that means that there is more to be done, right? Another theme has been, so all can hear. I like that one too. But not everybody has heard yet. That means that there's more to be done. There's always more to do. Are you willing to be a part to see that it gets done? Now, if you've been writing these down, you'll see that we've made out a little acrostic. And it says, together each accomplishes more. That's the theme of unity for this morning. Together, each accomplishes more. We need to be unified. No matter who you voted for in the last election or what you think about this over here or that over there, we need to be unified when it comes to the things of God. We need to be unified to see God's kingdom come to manifestation and glory. As the praise team comes, I would like for everybody to stand. We've been talking about unity. Are you part of the team? Well, let's, let's start with the first part of the team, team. And that is part of the team of the body of Christ. Have you surrendered all to Jesus? It's one thing to say, yeah, Jesus is my Lord, but yeah, and live, live however you want. It's another to say Jesus is my Lord and actually live as that way. In other words, he is my Lord. I'll obey him. Have you made yourself part of the team? Are you living for Jesus Christ? If not, I want to encourage you this morning. Don't wait another day. Don't wait because we're not promised tomorrow. Today may be our time to expire. So don't wait. Make Jesus the Lord of your life today. Make him number one today. That's part of being, a, that's the start of being a part of the team, as to being a part of the blessings, like the, the, the scripture says, like the oil that's running over the beard of Aaron. Next is, has God called you to do something and you haven't done it yet? Sometimes we get into a rut where we're not hearing from the Lord 
And my first question then becomes, have I done the last thing that God has asked me to do? Or did I shelf it thinking I'll get to it tomorrow because and tomorrow never comes? So have you done what God has asked you to do? Here's another question. Have you been called into missions? It may be that God has called you into missions and you've been ignoring that call. I'll never forget when the Lord told me he called me to be a youth pastor. I was like, "Uh uh-uh. No. But that changed because God had his way and I was willing to submit to his authority. Have you been called to missions? There's plenty of people out there that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then are you willing to answer that call? And it may not even be missions. It may be something else that God has called you to do. Have you started working on that call? Have you begun to step out in faith? If not, I want to encourage you, don't wait till tomorrow because tomorrow's not going to get here. Make that choice today to do what God has called you to do. God is looking for people to step out in faith, to follow after him, to do the things he's asked them to do. Be like that son. Granted, you remember the parable. There's a parable that Jesus told about two sons. The father went to the first one and said, go work in the field. And the first one said, nah, I'm not going to do it, Dad. He went to the second one and said, go work in the field. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. The second one never went out into the field, but the first one felt bad about telling the father no and went out in the field and started doing the work. And Jesus said, now, who is the one that accomplished the will of the father? And they said, it was the first one. And he said, you are correct. I'm, or the second one, I'm sorry. The, the first one that told him, no, you're correct. And he, because he went and actually did the work, God is looking for us to accomplish the work that he has for each and every one of us, for us individually, for us as a church, and us as a corporate body, as the body of Christ. Are we willing to fulfill that call? As the praise team leads us in this final song this morning, I want to invite you to come to this altar and surrender all to Jesus and and tell him yes to the call that he's placed in your life. It may be to be a blue-collar worker, to be a manager, or be whatever, or called into missions, whatever that call is, but just to tell the Lord yes. Or if you just want to come and say, hey, Lord, I just want to reconfirm my, my commitment to you. Yes, I will do what you've called me to do. Would you take the time to do that this morning? Draw me close. Let's go before the Lord one more time. Father, this day we choose to fulfill your will. God, we choose to follow after you. And Lord, I pray over the will of us individually. 
that you give us clarity. Open the doors that need to be opened. Shut any doors that need to be shut. Lord, I pray over the will of this church, for your, for the, your will for this church, that your will be accomplished in Jesus' name and your will over the body of Christ. May we be people of unity. Would you forgive us of sowing discord? God, would you forgive us of speaking evil of our neighbor? Will we repent? Forgive us of not walking in unity. And I thank you for correcting us and loving us. Lord, you are the God of love. You are love. Your mercy endures forever. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for putting up with us, for being patient with us, and loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming this morning. We look forward to seeing you tonight in small groups. You are dismissed.